a trivia question. How many questions are there in Scripture? Somebody give me a guess. <laughs> it's a big book. 3,000 questions, over 3,000 questions. There are questions of God asking humankind, such as the question put to Adam and Eve in the garden, where are you? And questions to God by humankind, such as Cain's question, am I my brother's keeper? The longest list of questions in the Bible can be found in the book of Job, chapters 38 and 39. Here's an excerpt. We'll be using the New Revised Standard Version updated edition. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? I will question you. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind scatters upon the earth? Who had cut a channel for the torrents of rain, and a way for the thunderbolt? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts, or given understanding to the mind? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Did anybody pick up on the irony of our scripture reading? Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And how does the Lord answer Job? With a bunch of questions. I love it. Every time I do a sermon answering questions, this is the first time I've done it here, I do so with conscious humility. I recognize that my answers may not be the answers of the experts or answers given by those in the know or answers held by the majority of those who call themselves Christian, although I'd like to think I'm still a Christian no matter how I might answer these questions. My answers are my answers. They are not your answers. And please note, I'm not asking you to make my answers your answers. In this, what do I call it, exercise, approach, I'm keeping three things in mind. First, the wonderful words of the church father, Augustine, who said, if you understand, it is not God. And second, the more recent words of Heidi Haverkamp, who writes, I wonder if we often make what we think we know about God into idols. Because we all know that the number one and two commandments are to have no other gods and no idols before God. And finally, I fondly remember the statement by my oldest daughter, Corinne, many years ago when she said, if God made us to ask such questions, then there must be answers. Very wise of a young woman. There must be answers. With that as an introduction, on to the questions. For in the words of Phil Cousineau, Questions tune the soul. Questions tune the soul. So the first question. What is the Seventh-day Adventist understanding of heaven? Seventh-day Adventists do not believe that people go to heaven or hell when they die. They believe that the dead remain unconscious or asleep until Christ comes again. This way of thinking comes from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Next question. Several weeks ago, you mentioned religious pluralism in your sermon. It's my understanding that disciples of Christ hold to the statement, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. I've also read that for modern disciples, the one essential is the acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and obedience to Christ in baptism. Please talk about the essentials of faith according to this denomination and what that means for interaction with people of other beliefs. That's a good question. The essentials of faith of the Christian church disciples of Christ. 
What makes us disciples? Certainly the recognition and, and acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord and our Savior. Certainly baptism is the way into that recognition and acceptance. And as disciples of Christ, we certainly affirm that the Lord's Supper plays an important role in our way of living out our faith. I like how the statement ends, in all things charity, literally in all things grace, with grace meaning acceptance, courteousness, and goodwill. These are certainly important when interacting with people of other faiths and beliefs, sharing what we believe and listening with grace, with charity, with goodwill to others' beliefs without condemnation or judgment. If the word of God is alive and active, as it says in Hebrews 4.12, why haven't more books been added to the biblical canon? No more books, have, here's my answer. No more books have been added to the biblical canon because no more books have been written. Ha, ha, ha. Of course, this begs the question, is the word of God always written down? Hmm, that's my question. And what do we mean by canon? The canon is those books which are considered authoritative by the religious community, by the church. The Bible, for us, is our canon. Jewish canon, or the Old Testament, was finalized in the period when Jesus was born. The first Christian canon was called the Muratorian canon, which was compiled in the year 170 after Jesus died. The Muratorian canon included all of the New Testament books except Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, and 3 John. In the year 363, the Council of Laodicea stated that only the New Test Old Testament and 26 books of the New Testament except Revelation were in the canon. In the year 393, the Council of Hippo finally affirmed the current 27 books that we have in Scripture. So it took about 400 years for the Christian Bible to come into its current form. A related question which I got, why does the Protestant Bible have less books in it than the Catholic Bible? Well, in the 1500s, Protestant leaders decided to organize the Old Testament material according to the official canon of Judaism, rather than the ancient Greek Septuagint. The Septuagint is an ancient Greek translation of Hebrew Old Testament, which has 51 books in it. The Protestant Bible has only 39 books. The Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches did not follow the Protestant revisions, and they continued to base their Old Testament on the Greek Septuagint. Difference of opinion. Oh my, here's a good one. Please explain the reason for the church separations in the last few years. Some people may not know. I'm not clear either, and are we judging our fellow humankind? Why do churches separate? There are thousands of denominations in the United States alone. There's something like 40,000 Christian denominations throughout the world. Why do churches separate? Well, it's similar to the question, why do people fall out of relationship? Why do people disagree? For a myriad of reasons. The church has split repeatedly over its 2,000-year history. The most famous split is probably the split in the year 1054, which involved the Church of Rome, which became the Roman Catholic Church, and the church in Constantinople, Turkey, what became the Eastern Orthodox Church. And ever since 1054, over the last thousand years, we've been splitting like crazy. We've been splitting like crazy. The church in the United States has split over slavery, over the role of music and worship, over the role of women presiding at the table on Sunday, over the role of elders and who should be an elder and who can't be an elder, and most recently over different understandings of sexual expression and relationships. 
How we read and understand scripture often accounts for the differences. One person often reads X, another person often reads Y. And they can't get along, so they split. And are we judging our fellow humankind when we do so? Yes, you would think we could get along, at least on Sunday mornings, right? What happened to Joseph later in life after Jesus was born? Good question. Since Joseph does not appear in the accounts of Jesus' ministry, of Jesus' ministry church tradition supposes that Joseph died during Jesus' quiet years, those 30 years or so before he began ministry. In the Lord's Prayer, we ask, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Does God ever lead us into temptation? Seems like we do so quite well on our own. I would agree. And then a related question I re received. Saul received an evil spirit from the Lord. What does this mean? These two questions are similar. In ancient times, and even in our own times, We've ascribed our actions to divine inspiration or influence. In this line of thinking, it follows that both good and bad behavior can be understood as coming from God. God, through the prophet Isaiah, says, I form the light and I create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. This has long been a troubling line of scripture. On the other hand, the book of James tells us, no one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and God himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Does God tempt us? I don't know. I, I, I'll agree with James, who says, What do you think about the lesson on creation? Do you think that each day and night was a literal 24-hour period? Or do you believe that each day was a certain era or amount of time? Good question. Let's see. I'll, answer, I'll put on my astronomer's hat. If God had created on the planet Mercury, one day and night would be 4,224 hours long because Mercury takes 176 days, Earth days, to revolve around its axis. Whereas if God had created on the largest planet of our solar system, Jupiter, that would have taken only 10 hours in a day and night period on Jupiter. I think the biblical authors of the creation story in Genesis 1 were thinking as humans think on Earth. And it takes 24 hours to spin the earth one day. They were thinking in human terms. God's time, I think, is a little different than ours. What are the degrees of sainthood? Do we have any saints in the house? I have no idea how to answer this question. The Roman Catholic Church has different designations as individuals go through the process of becoming a saint. I believe the Roman Catholic Church has four steps, degrees of sainthood, to become a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. We Protestants don't have saints per se, or we could say we're all saints as Protestants. Is there a hierarchy in heaven? Well, this is easy. I don't know. I haven't been there yet. When I return, I'll let you know. <laughs> However, what has sort of stuck in Christian tradition is the, author, is the answer by the author Pseudo-Dionysius the Aeropagite, who wrote in the 5th or 6th century that there are nine levels of spiritual beings. The highest orders are the seraphim, the cherubim, and the, and the opanim. And the middle orders are the dominions, the virtues, and the powers. And the lowest orders are the principalities, archangels, and angels. So take that for what you will. What's the difference between a disciple and an apostle? Good question. A disciple is literally a student 
one who learns. An apostle is a messenger, or one who is sent. One can be both. And, interestingly, both are used interchangeably in the Gospels for the original 12 followers of Jesus. Sometimes they're called apostles. Sometimes they're called disciples. What happened to all the people who died before Jesus? I have no idea how they lived or died. Church tradition does talk about the harrowing of hell. The harrowing of hell. Jesus descended into hell or the depths after he was crucified and before he was resurrected i.e. on that Saturday, is often called the harrowing of hell. It's written in 1 Peter, for this is the reason the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead, so that, though they had been judged in the flesh as everyone is judged, they might live in the spirit as God lives. What's the best reason for living a godly life in service to others? To go to heaven or to live peaceful life. Both. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I think it might be fair to say that living in the way of God's will to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth is a good reason for living a godly life in service to others. And I think this is a trick question. Who did Cain, Abel, and Seth marry? I definitely have no idea. Scripture doesn't say. And uh, let's see. This is the last question. Uh, does someone who commits suicide go to heaven? That's a good question. And one that's close to my heart and my way of life. Here's how I would answer that. God is either gracious or God is not gracious. And I'm not a fan of saying God is an either or God. But in this one, in my way of thinking, God is either gracious or God is not gracious. I personally believe that the words if and but as they apply to judgment are human creations and not of God. There is no if in God. If you are good, then God is good. There is no but with God. You did some good, but you also had a few moments of weakness. Therefore, sorry, no heavenly reward for you. I don't think God is an if and but God. In the words of Paul, which I take very seriously, nothing can separate us from the love of God that we know in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that we know in Christ Jesus. And that concludes the questions that I received. Thank you so much for them. They got me thinking over the last couple of weeks. I think Paul's words, which I just quoted, are a good lens to look at any question about the Christian faith. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Not even my answers. Amen.